In this lecture, we're going to analyze and interpret the results we obtained from our discussion of a particle moving in a rigid box, also known as an infinite potential well. So let's suppose once again we have a free particle with mass m that is moving inside the following rigid box. So we have the right and left wall of the box and the particle is moving only along the bottom of that box. So this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis where the y-axis represents the potential energy of that free particle and the x-axis represents the position of that particle along the bottom portion of our box. Now, the left corner of the box is given by x equals 0, and the right corner of the box is given by x equals L. So the width of the box is given by the distance L, and the particle moves between the two corners of the box, and at any given point between these two corners of the box, the potential energy of our particle is given by 0. Now, previously we saw that the wave function psi of x, that represents our motion and behavior of that particle with potential energy of zero, is given by this equation. So, psi of x is equal to the square root of 2 divided by L multiplied by sine of pi multiplied by N divided by L times x. So this is once again the wave function that describes the motion of this particle. This describes the wave that is produced by our free particle. Now, what exactly is our meaning of n? So n represents the quantum number of our particle. It's a positive value. It could be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Now, L represents the width of our box. It's the distance between our two corners. X represents the position of our particle between these two points. And finally, the square root of 2 divided by L represents the amplitude of our wave produced by this particle. Now, recall that if we take the square of the absolute value of the wave function, if we take the square of the absolute value of this entire right side, that will give us the probability density, the probability distribution of our particle as it moves between these two positions. So let's suppose our quantum number n is equal to 1. Let's graph the probability density versus the position of our particle as it moves within the following box. So we get the following diagram. So, once again, the y-axis is the square of the absolute value of our wave function. It's the square of the absolute value of this quantity. And the x-axis represents the position of our particle between our two corners of our box, where this is x equals 0, and this point is x equals L. So we get the following distribution. So what exactly is the meaning of this distribution? So, notice that at this particular point along our distribution, this represents the highest point of our probability density. So that means at any given moment in time, the particle is most likely to be found at this position along our x-axis, directly at the center. Now, if we continue that with n equals 2 and n equals 3, we get 2 humps and then we get 3 humps. So for this particular case, at any given moment in time, our particle is most likely found at this position and this position and is not likely to be found at the center as in this case. Now, if we continue with n equals 3, we get the following diagram. So basically, these three groups graphs represent the probability density of our particle as it moves along the rigid box, where the y-axis gives the value of the square of the absolute value of this function. Now, from these graphs, we see that the particle is more likely to be found in one place than in another. Specifically for this case, in quantum mechanics, we see that the particle for quantum number n equals 1 is more likely to be found at the center, at the middle of our one-dimensional rigid box, than 
at the corners. So at the corners, there is a 0% probability, a 0 probability of finding our particle. But at the center, that is where our particle is most likely to be found. Now let's consider one type of application of this in the real world. Let's consider an electron moving back and forth along a flat, thin piece of metal. So we have our very flat piece of metal and the electron is moving back and forth as in the case of the one-dimensional rigid box. So based on the argument above, the electron will most likely be found at the center of our uh, metal at any given moment in time. So that's what we can interpret from all this information. Now, let's move on to the amplitude. So earlier we said the amplitude is equal to the square of 2 divided by L. And this tells us, basically tells us the height of our wave that is produced by this particle. And if we square that value, if we take the square of the absolute value, that gives us basically the height of our amplitude. So it gives us the height of our probability density density value. So, the amplitude from this equation tells us that it only depends on the width of that box. And that is given by L. So, as you decrease the width of the box, you increase the amplitude of that wave. So, if L decreases, if the box gets smaller along the x-axis, then the amplitude of the wave produced, this quantity will increase. And because this increases the square of our absolute value of our wave function will also increase. And so that will increase the probability of finding our electron or our particle at the center of our box for the case of n equals 1. So once again, for the case of n equals 1, Let's suppose the y-axis is the square of the absolute value of our wave function psi. And the x-axis is our position along the x-axis, which is given by our distance L. So for this particular box with a width of L, we have the following hill produced. But for this case, where we increase our distance to 2L, we see that because the amplitude decreases, that will decrease decrease the wave function and will decrease the uh, square of the absolute value of that wave function. So our hill will basically decrease and we see that now there is a smaller probability of finding our electron, our particle at the center than in this particular case. So that is the relationship between the amplitude, our width L, as well as the probability. And finally, let's move on to analyzing the energy. So, in the previous lecture we saw that E is equal to N squared multiplied by H squared divided by 8 times M times L squared, where L once again is the width, M represents our mass, and H represents Planck's constant, and N represents the quantum number of our particle. Now notice, for any particular box that has a fixed L value, this quantity will be a constant. So H squared divided by 8 times M times L squared is a constant as long as our L, the width of the box, is a fixed value. And we see that the energy of the particle for any given quantum number only depends on the quantum number itself as long as our L is fixed. So, that basically means if we plot the following diagram where our y-axis is the energy and the x-axis is our position, so our width of the box is a fixed value and it's given by L, then if we increase our n value, we see that the energy will jump from this quantity to this quantity, then to this quantity when we increase from n equals 1 to n equals 2 
to n equals 3. So this is basically in accordance with the quantum theory of energy. That is, we see that energy is quantized. It exists in discrete units. For example, the energy cannot be found anywhere between these red lines. The energy of our particle for n equals 1 lies along this axis, for n equals 2 it lies along this axis, and for n equals 3 it lies along this axis. So, each red line represents the energy associated with each quantum number, and we see for any given fixed L, this equation becomes as follows. So, E n is equal to n squared multiplied by, uh, by E1 where E1 is simply the quantity of energy of our particle in the rigid box when our quantum number is equal to 1. So if we take the energy value of this and multiply it by n squared, that will give us the energy of our particle for some other n quantum number.